Um, uh, how drugs get into your nervous system, or what they do to your nervous system, uh, especially your brain. In order to understand effects of the psychoactive substances, we need to look at the ner nervous system. There's two primary s nervous systems, the peripheral and the, and the central nervous system. Uh, central nervous system is just your brain, your spinal column. All your other nerves in your body, that's your peripheral nervous system. Uh, the peripheral nervous system uh, collects information, sends it to the central nervous system, which then responds to the stimulus back through the peripheral nervous system. Proper response will go through appropriate systems of the body, your nervous system, your skeletal system, your endocrine system, your digestive system, respiratory system, uh, muscular system, circulatory system, urinary system, lymphatic system, and the integumentary uh, system, that's your skin. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh, we are talking about lymph nodes yesterday. We are talking about lymph nodes because that's what gets infected with the bubonic plague. And uh, mm -hmm. then that area bruises markedly. Uh, of course, when it bruises, it turns blue, it turns dark blue, and then it turns black. And that's why they called it the Black Plague. Uh -huh. People would die, they'd have bruises on their necks because you have lymph nodes here, you've got lymph nodes under your armpits, so they would, mm -hmm. uh, you get black spots here, your groin, of course, you've got some lymph nodes, and there's lymph nodes throughout your body, but uh, it, all, it would all turn black. And those were called bubos. as much fun as that is. Psychoactive drugs may alter information head for the brain, um, uh, like painkillers to block uh, the pain uh, message going to the brain so that you don't feel the brain, uh, feel the pain. That's what opiates do. They just block the pain message. Uh, that's what uh, ibuprofen does. Yeah. Yeah, it blocks substance P. Uh, psychoactive drugs can disrupt messages sent back to the parts of the body, uh, that like when you're drunk. Uh, you can't, all of a sudden, your, your, your feet don't work very well, and you can't get your keys in the lock. Because your your uh, the alcohol has affected uh, your brain to the extent that that part of your body doesn't function anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, psychoactive drugs can disrupt thinking, and of course, anybody that's ever t tried to talk to a drunk, uh, they they just don't make any sense. Everything's funny to them, as stupid as that. they think they can dance. You know, all kinds of dumb things happen. Psychoactive drugs uh, can affect an organ when they pass through it or affect uh, them uh, when the central nervous system sends back a distorted message. And uh, of course this has to do with your liver, has to do with your kidneys, has to do with a lot of things. One of the reasons why people urinate all over themselves, they don't, that, their uh, urinary sphincter, they lose control of. And for us, uh, this is uh, usually a, a, a more seasoned alcoholic uh, they're, they, they lose the, these sensations and they don't, don't understand that they're there. <clears throat> Evolutionary psychologists speculate that any changes in the human form, including the brain, continued because they assisted the individual for their survival. If it was a positive thing, then, then it, it was accepted. If it was a negative thing, uh, then sometimes it was rejected. Uh, a good example of this is the human affinity for sugar and fat, which provides a quick and more prolonged energy source. So we crave fat, we crave sugar, we needed to because we were uh, in a, a uh, situation of fast and feast and famine. Uh, sometimes we had food and sometimes we didn't. Uh, so we needed to crave sugar so that we uh, always ate the, uh, the substances that gave us the most energy. Uh, this is what happened during uh, the Depre Great Depression. Uh, you know, they had, uh, they had developed a, a means of cooking, uh, and then when the Great Depression came along, all of a sudden, they started making a lot of gravies. They, start, they used all the fat. They, they never threw it away. It, they used all the fat. Uh, in the South, they started making uh, uh, gravy out of the sausage grease. And that's what biscuits and gravy are all about. They would fry up some, uh, <clears throat> one, the first day they would make sausages, mm -hmm. sausages and biscuits, and then they would eat biscuits and sausages. The next day they would eat biscuits and gravy from the grease left over from the, uh, from the uh, sausage. Mm -hmm. 
that's one of the reasons why they have that. That's why they eat sausage or uh, uh, biscuits and gravy in the South a lot. They didn't have a lot of food, so they, they had to do these things. Uh, or they would save a little bit, or they'd make it out of bacon grease. I mean, they'd make it out of just, they'd make gravy out of just about anything. Uh, another example would be the affinity uh, for sexual intercourse for both males and females, which led to offspring, which guaranteed uh, the survival of the species, of course. Uh, there is a reason why humans desire sex. It's so that they will procreate. Uh, other animals uh, go into heat. They have estrus and whatnot. <clears throat> and these individuals, or the, these species, this is their affinity for survival. Uh, I have two cats right now. I have a, a tomcat and a female cat. Female cat's been fixed. Uh, the tomcat is the one I saved. Uh, it's, it's the one that was starving to death. Well, he's finally eaten enough food that now he's starting to feel randy. So he's <laughs> chasing the female cat all over the house, which is kind of weird because he is a viable male, but she is not a viable female, yet she, he will not leave her alone. And she's real aggressive. <laughs> so we'll see what happens. He might lose his face, uh, but he won't leave her alone. He just follows her around, you know, with that little purring thing going yeah. on. She can't possibly be in heat because she's fixed. Yeah. Following the evolutionary premise, uh, psychoactive substances must serve some purpose. Uh, one reason may be that most psychoactive substances affect our, our natural survival mechanisms. Me mechanisms that initially cause desirable effects. And the desirable effects are alcohol makes you feel good, uh, opiates make you feel good, they take away the pain, they make you forget things. Uh, so these are all positive things and these are, are the reasons why people start using them. Uh, cocaine gives you energy, you know, uh, crystal meth gives you energy and it makes you horny, uh, you know, all of these things. But eventually, of course, uh, the more you use, the uh, less positive effects you get. Eventually, as humans, uh, we may adapt to the effects of these substances, but as for now, these substances are subverting our survival mechanisms, and in many cases, the, results, uh, the result is anti-survival, like uh, as with crystal meth. Crystal meth or amphetamines, uh, sure, they keep you awake and, and you're able to do what you need to do, uh, but they're also accelerating your life at the same time. Uh, they're rotting your teeth out. All kinds of interesting things are happening to you, and you'll die young. Uh, I just had a friend who's... <coughs> she couldn't say no to her son. She had, she had two sons. An old, uh, one was older than the other, of course. Uh, her oldest son, uh, she couldn't say no to, and he was a meth head. And she, so she would do what she needed to do to get him his fix. Uh, and eventually he lost his ability to walk. Uh, he uh, uh, messed up his thyroid. Uh, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with him because they wouldn't admit that he was a meth head. So uh, they take him into the doctor and, and they would say, well, does he use drugs? And of course they said, no. Well, he's dead now. He's dead of old age. Uh, he's like 37, 38 years old. Just died not very long ago. As sad as that is. <clears throat> okay. And she just came to my house to borrow the wood. I used to complain to her. I, I kept telling her her sons are supposed to collect, get wood for her. Mm -hmm. And she wouldn't, doesn't make them do anything. So she's got one dead son now. It's hard to tell what's going to happen to the other, the other son. Oh, no. Yeah. And she's also taking care of her mother that's in her, who's in her 80s and has osteoporosis and lives in a separate house, so they have to heat two houses, as weird as that is. That's one of the reasons why she needs my wood. Damn it. <clears throat> anyway, we'll see what happens. Uh, we'll see how much wood she steals. I told her she could have some. She's only got a car, so she can only fill up the trunk. Maybe she'll fill up the back seat too, I don't know. Maybe she'll take my whole wood pile. <laughs> the human brain uh, not only maintains the largest cerebrum, 
uh, of all creatures, but uh, all the structures of the lower animals. Uh, this is the new brain and the old brain. The new brain is the cerebrum, of course. The old brain is the cerebellum and, uh, and the primitive brain structures. Uh, as survival became more complex, higher animals, animal forms developed new brain uh, structures to aid them with survival. Uh, they needed them. Uh, fish, crocodiles, uh, the more vicious they are, uh, the more primitive their brains, they didn't really need uh, any intellectual capacity. Uh, but as primates uh, rose up and off uh, all fours, uh, they started needing uh, different ways to survive. And of course, in order to survive, they needed to develop brain mass. The primitive uh, primal or old brain consists of brain, the brain stem, cerebellum, midbrain, uh, which is also known as the mesocortex and the limbic system. These brain structures can be found from animals as primitive as fish, and of course, as humans, we have them too. Uh, it is th this portion of the, of the, of the brain that, that keeps us alive. This is the part that makes our heart beat. This is the part that allows us to breathe. Respiration, heartbeat, uh, body temperature, they ma maintains body temperature. Uh, the, uh, in the center of the brain, of course, is the hypothalamus and the pituitary, and that uh, controls our hormone release. And the cerebellum, of course, controls our movement. Uh, the old brain, the limbic system, is the area that acknowledges the experience of basic emotions and cravings. Uh, fear, anger, hunger, thirst, lust, pain, pleasure, it all comes from our primitive brain. The old brain is the area that imprints survival memories, uh, specifically the limbic system. Uh, since it has to do with survival, uh, certain things will be imprinted on the brain uh, that you wish wouldn't be. Uh, trauma, of course, will be imprinted on the brain, and it's difficult to get rid of that idea uh, or the memory of, of, the, uh, of the trauma. Uh, the idea is that you need to remember this so that if you're ever in that situation again, you won't suffer the same trauma. Uh, so there are certain things that we remember. <coughs> I was thinking about this yesterday because I had a dream about my second wife. And the dream, in, in the dream, I was an old man like I am right now, and she was a young, she was young like when I first met her. Uh, and she wouldn't have anything to do with me. She didn't want to talk to me at all. Uh, which I found really kind of curious. I found it interesting uh, that she didn't want to talk to me at all. As a matter of fact, she acted like she didn't remember who I was, which is possible, I guess. And yeah. She can forget people or not want to remember people, not want her to remember people. But it has to do with survival. We have selective memory. Uh, sometimes things don't affect us so we don't remember them. Other things we try to forget. <clears throat> and potentially I'm somebody that you would try to forget, as tragic <laughs> as that is. Uh, most psychoactive substances act on the old brain, causing uh, euphoria in this area, and thus providing the euphoric memories that lead to addiction. <clears throat> so we remember good things and we remember bad things. We remember things that have to do, have to do with survival. The emotions of the old brain overpower the reasoning capacity of the cerebrum and lead to repeated taking of euphoric substances. As hominids uh, advanced over time, uh, more and more brain power was needed to survive. This came to us in the form of the cerebrum and the highly convoluted neocortex. Uh, the new brain aids us in sol solving of problems of survival. Uh, of course, we're not the largest brain hominid that has ever existed. Uh, the Neanderthal man had a larger brain than we have, uh, about 250 uh, cubic uh, centimeters larger than ours. Most of the time, uh, the new brain controls the old brain. Uh, reasoning will trump emotion. Uh, that's the way it normally works. However, when a person uses psychoactive substances, the craving from the old brain may override the rational arguments. Uh, that the drugs are too expensive, why in the world am I spending all this money? Uh, there are bad side effects to most drugs. Uh, hangover if you're drinking. Uh, what are 
bad side effects of LSD. Well, I can't think of any off the top of my head. It is dangerous, potentially, uh, if you use psychoactive substances, you will uh, drift into schizophrenia. If you take crystal meth, it blocks um, the reuptake of, of uh, epinephrine and it can cause psychotic episodes. Um, and of course, everybody has other responsibilities that are more important than their own pleasure. Uh, pleasure shouldn't be the one thing that you're after, but of course, uh, you have just used a psychoactive substance that uh, overrides all of your arguments. The reward reinforcement pathway encourages a, a human to perform a repeat an action that promotes survival. It is this pathway that is affected by psychoactive substances. The reward reinforcement pathway has to do with tasting food that tastes really good, and so you want to eat it, or having sex it feels really good, so you want to do it again. These are things, this is what the reward reinforcement pathway is for. Uh, you meet somebody who's a who's really nice and, and uh, you want to be around that person some more. And that's, that's a positive thing. That's a really, really positive thing. Uh, and that's what the re reward reinforcement pathway is all about. So it, it allows us to survive. It, 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 uh, it gives us the, the desire to survive or it gives us, uh, tells us what we need to repeat so that we can survive. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, let's take out, take out the drugs part, but it's sex and rock and roll and food, you know, really good food, or food that uh, is satiating. Uh, I'm craving my lunch because I have apples in my lunch. I really like Granny Smith apples, especially when they're nice and, and uh, uh, crisp. The mushy ones, I'm, I'm not real crazy about. But I'm craving them right now, but that's, that, that apple is really good for me. Uh, so potentially, uh, I will have, uh, I have two in my, in my lunch, so I have two Granny Smith apples for lunch. Uh, they're kind of expensive, but uh, I figure they're healthy and uh, I'm worth it. <clears throat> also referred to as the mesolimbic uh, dopaminergic reward pathway, it has a stop switch, the orbit, or, orbital frontal cortex. This is the orbital frontal cortex. Your reasoning portion of your brain says stop. How many apples can you eat anyway? How many, how many do you have to eat before you feel satiated? That's your uh, orbital, uh, <laughs> orbital frontal cortex, this portion right here, tells you stop. Or it can say, wow, that was a really good apple, let's eat another. And that's the more switch. So it has a stop and a, and a, and a go switch. Uh, the more area is also known as the pleasure center and encompasses four structures. The amygdala, the lateral hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens septi, and the ventral tegmental area. This is the loop. This is the dopaminergic loop that we refer to with the re as the reward reinforcement pathway. The amygdala, which has to do with emotion, the lateral hypothalamus, the nucleus accumbens septi and the ventral tegmental area. These are the reward, the dopaminergic reward pathway. The pleasure center serves two purposes. It gives us a feeling of satisfaction when the need is fulfilled or even the anticipation that a need will be fulfilled. It gives us a surge of relief or intense <clears throat> satisfaction when the pain is diminished. People talk about hitting themselves with a hammer and that people will ask them, why did you, why did you hit yourself in the, in, uh, in the head with a hammer? And they say, because it felt so good when I stopped. Yeah, that's exactly what happens here. This is part of the dopaminergic pathway. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there is a type of uh, sexual fetish where the individual will become anoxic. Somebody will strangle them while they were ha are having sex with them. And then right at the end, right before they orgasm, they will release their hands and, and allow them to breathe. Now, why in the world would they do that? It, it's, I don't know if you've ever almost choked to death. It's not the most pleasant thing in the world, but being able to breathe is a relief and it feels good. So that's why they're doing these things. There was once upon a time I was working in, uh, this is at Offutt Air Force Base, 
uh, they, this pilot was supposed to take a flight and he didn't show up. Now, Air Force pilot, I mean, you know, it's not like you can go to work when you want to and take off when you want to. Yeah. That's not the way the military works. You're either there, you're, you're always somewhere when you're supposed to be yeah. on active duty. Well, this guy didn't show up. So they started looking for him. They found him in his locker. What he was doing, uh, what do they call that? Uh, erotic, I don't know, anyway. Well, what he was doing, he was, he had a, a ligature around his neck. He was standing on books and he would lean forward until his knees hit the side of the, uh, uh, what was he in? <laughs> I just told you what he was in. Anyway, we did the, the, the side, and he would hold himself there, strangling himself, while he was masturbating. Just before he ejaculated, he would relieve the pressure and orgasm, and, and, and he got uh, erotic pleasure out of uh, strangling himself. That's, and he did this over and over and over again. Because, well, he, ma he was masturbating. This time the book slipped and he fell, he fell uh, and he grabbed him in the, in the throat and he strangled himself to death. So we had to get him out of there. He'd been dead for about 12 hours. We had to pull him out and he was stuck. I mean it was a locker so it was, he just barely fit. And that was the whole point. I mean, he just barely fit so theoretically he sh shouldn't have died, but he, the book slipped, so yeah, it changed his whole structure, uh, position in the, in the locker, he strangled himself to death. Why am I talking about this? <laughs> oh, we're talking about the surge of relief. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so he was getting sexual pleasure out of the surge of relief, uh, and of course, he had just ejaculated all over the, the locker. It turned out that he'd been in there a lot, way, way more than anybody wanted to think about. <laughs> uh, and we had to pull him out. Of course, Ray Mortis had already set in, and he was jammed up in there. It was a mess. It was just a mess. And of course, he'd slime the thing all up with his with his ejaculate, so it was just horrible. And of course, when somebody strangles to death like that and spends time afterwards, they turn black, their face turns black. It was not, it was not fun getting that guy out, and he started stinking too, it was, it was ugly. Luckily, he was a little bitty guy, so he wasn't really all that heavy. But uh, we had to pull him out. And, But 12 hours? I yeah, about 12 hours. It was 12 hours. It was over the weekend, so it was a Monday morning. Oh. And it had happened, you know, Sunday morning <coughs> uh, or whatever. So it, it had happened. Anyway, so. <laughs> oh, the strange things people do. Uh, psychoactive substances activate the pleasure, of cir uh, the pleasure circuit. Uh, and rewards the individual with a feeling of satisfaction or pain relief. Unfortunately, psychoactive substances overactivate the pleasure center and shut down the stop switch, enabling the individual to feel an intense need to continue its use. So that's what psychoactive substances do. Uh, you drink, you, you go to the bar and you drink a beer, um, and you were only planning on drinking a beer, but uh, your buddy comes in and he starts drinking. So you, you continue to drink and, and now you don't, now your stop switch is, is, is messed up. So you don't know when to stop. A lot of people say, well, I, you know, I, I, know, I know my capacity. I can stop anytime I want to. But they continue to get drunk. But yeah. you know, their stop switch has been messed up. Three phases of brain activity with the reward reinforcement pathway. Uh, the anticipation of drug use or compulsive behavior creates craving. Uh, so it's just the anticipation, the feeling that you're going to do it. I know it's, it's Saturday. Uh, every Saturday I get drunk. I binge drink all Saturday. 
and just the knowledge that you're, you've got a case of beer at home and that you're going to binge drink all weekend, that gives you a cra craving for the alcohol. Uh, internal or external cues activate the amygdala, which causes a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which in turn activates the nucleus accumbens, causing the craving. So we, we do have an, uh, an internal cue. The internal cue is that we're going to get drunk this weekend. And today is Saturday or Friday, I don't know. Anyway, so we get this craving, and of course, that has to do with the addiction as well. For an alcoholic passing a bar, this is a problem that I saw up north a lot. Uh, if they were around, uh, if they were where they uh, normally got drunk, or where they were, if they were around where they normally used, they had to use again. If they were, if they interacted with the people that they normally interacted with when they got drunk, they had to use. They, it was they had this really strange craving. For an alcoholic passing a bar which is an external cue, it would activate the, amyg uh, the amygdala causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens causing a craving for alcohol, just by passing the bar. For someone who smoked pot with their friends before they went away to school, uh, when they see their friends on spring break, uh, of course that's an external cue, it would activate the, uh, the amygdala causing a release of dopamine from the ventral tegmental area, which would activate the nucleus accumbens, causing a craving for pot. The second phase of the reward reinforcement pathway involves the brain telling the individual to do it again after ingesting the psychoactive substance. With use, dopamine is released from the ventral tegmental area, which activates the nucleus accumbens to continue the craving. So we've still got, uh, the, the craving is still taking place. This is one of the reasons why when somebody, meth heads are really kind of interesting. Uh, pot smokers will uh, share their pot with other people. Meth heads don't. They don't share anything. They're very, uh, very selfish. Uh, they, and they'll, they'll use it all. Every bit that they have, they will use. <laughs> so, so they're more selfish than pot smokers. Uh, they will have a stash and they will use it all. Uh, if they have a stash, no matter how, how big it is, they will use it all up. So if they have a little bit, they use it. If they have a lot, they use it all by themselves. Phase three of the reward reinforcement pathway involves the nucleus accumbens signaling the orbital frontal cortex that it has taken this in the substance and it asks for a signal of more or satiation. Uh, in addicts and abusers, the signal is weakened, as is the reasoning function of the area resulting in ingestion that does, does not lead to satiation. So they can't be satisfied. This is the problem, and this is what people will tell you, uh, meth, especially meth users. They're looking for the high that they had the first time that they used. They're always seeking the, that same high. Opi uh, heroin users will tell you the same thing, that they're chasing the white horse. S silly things like that. Uh, meth heads will do exactly the same thing. They're always looking for the same high they got the first time they used it. And of course, it doesn't work. Have you seen meth? Have you seen meth, how it looks? <laughs> no. you never seen it? Is that a movie? I don't know. I'm just saying, like, the drug. Have you seen it? Like, meth? Uh, yeah, I've seen it in the emergency room. I've seen crystal meth. It comes in a powdered crystalline form. Looks like, um, how can I explain? Ground up glass. Mm -hmm. Stuff that I saw. Can you sniff it? Did I sniff no, it? No, can you sniff it? Like, like do they so you, sniff can it? Can you snort it? Uh, yeah, you can snort it. You don't get the same. They usually smoke it because they get more of it into their system if they smoke it. And it's more rapid. She's, she's smoking meth right here. You can see it's a short pipe. It's a relatively short pipe. It's here in the bowl and she has to light it and, and cook it. And then she just sucks it down into her lungs. That's the way it normally works. <clears throat> Oh yeah, I've seen the residue too. It's 
You can't, that, that stuff can't be doing any, any good to your, to your lungs. That's ugly stuff. <clears throat> Psychoactive substances imprint the memory of euphoria or pain relief or deeply, uh, more deeply than most uh, natural survival memories. The alteration of the brain chemistry causes normal activities to be less pleasurable. Uh, a lot of times, uh, uh, people that are musicians, uh, they have the same fears that everybody else does. You know, they go out, they're afraid they'll screw up. Uh, they have performance anxiety and whatnot. And that's one of the reasons why, why musicians use drugs so much. They're trying to relieve that feeling that they're they're fakers, that they're not really very good musicians. Uh, you know, the college, theoretically, college professors have the same feelings. Feelings, am I, am I teaching you the right thing? Am I giving you the right information? Uh, am I giving you, it to you in, an, a, uh, in a manner that you will be able to understand? You know, this is, these, all this performance anxiety is, is very high. Uh, we've got a brand new uh, teacher that's never taught before. You know, Jeremiah Barber, uh, and it's really kind of interesting to, I, I was listening to him lecture the other day. He was squeaking like a teenage boy, and his voice kept cracking. And, of course, it was because he was afraid. He was afraid, you know. It's performance anxiety. Well, he's a professional presenter of, of material. You know, he's, he wanders around and, and does uh, presentations. And he's been doing this on the reservation for, for years. But here he's in front of a classroom full of students and his voice cracks. Fear. The alteration of brain chemistry causes normal activities to be less pleasurable. And this is, of course, is the biggest problem with marijuana. When, mar when people are stoned, everything is great, everything's wonderful, everything's interesting. Uh, when they're not stoned, uh, nothing is interesting. Everything is boring. And, of course, the pleasure is less pleasurable. But there's a reason for that. Uh, when, you use, uh, when you use drugs, um, you are activating, a, uh, you're activating dopamine, you're activating serotonin. Uh, and because your nerves are being overexcited, uh, in order pr to protect themselves from excitotoxicity, which would kill them, uh, they downregulate, so they reduce the number of receptor sites. Uh, so that they won't destroy themselves. This is one of the reasons why you're always chasing the first high. The first time you use this stuff, your brain was a, was a virgin. It was naive. It, it had no idea what was happening. And of course, then you shot all this stuff into your system, and you all of those centers uh, of pleasure, uh, they were all activated, and, and you had this, this amazing experience. Uh, but of course, the, those neurons, in order to protect themselves, had to downregulate. So the next time you tried to use, those neurons didn't have as many uh, receptor sites. So this time you can't get the same high you got before. Yeah. So you will be continually trying to trying to find that same high. Uh, this is one of the things that Amy uh, Winehouse did. Amy Winehouse would abstain from using alcohol for two or three months, and then she would binge drink. And uh, the reason she did it was so that she could, her system could heal. Uh, and, and so when the next time she used alcohol, uh, it was like Virgin Amy again. You know, it was virgin. So the, the receptor sites were, were, were all attuned to, uh, to whatever pleasure was, came next. This is why she overdosed. She drank herself to death. She, she had abstained for a couple weeks. Everybody said, oh, Amy's getting off the sauce. And the next thing you knew, she was dead of alcohol poisoning. That's, you know, she, she had tried to, she was playing this game of, of abstention and then binge drinking. And eventually, of course, it killed her. People can live with a lot of alcohol in their system, but you, you, know, you have to train yourself to do that. <clears throat> and she was untraining herself, and then she was having, uh, having another good time. And she died at 27. I mean, she was 27 years old when she died. Uh, 
Uh, Jimi Hendrix was 27 when he died. Janis Joplin was 27 when she died. Uh, who else died at 27? Uh, that's all I can think of. Anyway, Amy Winehouse died at 27. Uh, to a methamphetamine addict, the desire for drug, uh, the drug will be more important than their relationship with their children. As sad as that is, uh, we had situations in Pinyon where, where uh, uh, parents were selling their children for meth. They were prostituting their babies for meth. Prostituting them. That's, this is how little regard they have for the child and how, what high regard they have for their need for the meth. Uh, this isn't the only, of course, don't think that the, the people in Pinyon, there's something wrong with the people in Pinyon. The reality is, uh, when I was uh, in uh, Montana, uh, we saw the same thing on the Rocky Boy Reservation. Uh, a lady would have a house party. Uh, and uh, she would have a select amount of, of crystal meth that she was actually sharing, which is kind of odd, uh, but she would sell herself for more meth, and uh, she, would, she would allow people to have sex with her children in order for her to have more meth. And sometimes these meth parties would last for, for weeks. <clears throat> with, with the people coming and going, and there are individuals that want to have sex with, with children, pedophiles, uh, and they would uh, they'd give her money or they would give her meth, and uh, she would allow that to happen. Well, after one house party, of course, the police came in and they, uh, Child Protective Services took her children away. Uh, they gave her children to her parents. And of course, her parents couldn't believe that she would do something like that, so she gave them, they gave them back. And of course, the same thing happened the next weekend. Another house party, and the two kids are, don't have anything to eat because when you're, uh, when you're using meth, it's not like uh, marijuana, where you get hungry, uh, or you have the munchies. Uh, if you're using crystal meth, you, you're, not, you're not hungry. So... These kids didn't have anything to eat, so they were drinking beer. And they were, one of them was 18 months old, the other was two and a half. Yeah, they were both meth kids anyway. I mean, she, she, she wasn't exactly sure who the father was because she was stoned at the time and having sex with, you know, a, a series of men, and she didn't know which one impregnated her. Jeez. Did you see that on the news, that lady that killed three, her three kids? Which was on that? Oh, which was on that? In Phoenix? I didn't see that, no. That's yeah. Tragic. It's crazy. Yes, yeah, crazy, crazy. So it allows you to do stupid things. These drugs make you, well, normally, of course, the, if I see a child, I want to protect that child, even if it's, whether it's mine or whether it's not. But it short circuits that desire. And, and people will do really stupid things in order to get their methamphetamines. Uh, to, com the, to the compulsive gambler, uh, gambling will become more important to them than food or sex. And of course, you know, anyway, they gamble and they don't need, they don't need anything else. Uh, psychoactive substances tend to affect the physiological functioning of the body, especially the heart rate and the respiration. Uh, it is the effect on respiration that causes most drug overdose, emergencies, and death. Uh, that portion of their body will go to sleep. It's one of the reasons why we knock people out with opiates, is so that we can put them in a, in a, a form of sus suspended animation. We know exactly how much to give them. We give it to them by weight uh, so that we don't overdose them, and then we can do surgery on them. Well, these people are taking the opiates and of course they are overdosing and killing themselves. Uh, this is a real serious problem with fentanyl and now that we have disuvia, I think it's disuvia, yeah, yeah it's a thousand times stronger than morphine. How in the world, the world are they going to regulate it? You can't even <laughs> breathe the dust from that stuff without getting, overdosing yourself. I have no idea. This is going to be a mess. It's a mess already. Fentanyl is, is causing a lot of trouble. Yeah. 
Uh, they have to use fentanyl to knock me out because I'm not sensitive to opiates, but it only works for a select amount of time. I've awakened three times during surgery. That's not fun. Because it's the opiates that are supposed to take away the pain. You're supposed to forget the pain, but it's still there. I woke up during a heart cath one time and it felt like I had a garden hose stuck in, in yeah, 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 you know, it was a heart cath. Anyway, that was ugly. Uh, LSD marijuana and uh, rape drugs or psychedelics, they're not only, they not only affect the brain, but the new brain as well. Uh, the old brain and the new brain. These drugs especially affect memory as they activate two areas of the brain that help to control memories, the amygdala and the hippocampus. And of course, that's one of the reasons why people take such amazing trips while they are on LSD. Um, of course, if you're happy, we're talking about the amygdala being activated. It, uh, this is, has to do with emotion. Uh, the emotion that you have when you are tripping is the emotion that will be uh, accelerated during uh, your, your trip. And this is one of the reasons why they tell you if you're gonna if you're dropping LSD that you need to you know be in a uh, in your happy place. You need to, to be someplace where you're not going to have ugly thoughts because otherwise you'll see all kinds of monsters and whatnot. As people age from childhood to adolescence to adulthood, they learn to integrate the drives of the old brain with the reasoning and common sense of the new brain. Developmental problems, childhood traumas such as chaotic or abusive childhoods, compulsive behavior, or psychoactive drug use can circumvent survival mechanisms <clears throat> and lead to irrational behavior or addiction. Uh, this is death uh, that we're talking about here. Uh, people have been using tobacco for an extended length of time. People have been using alcohol for an extended length of time. People have been using all kinds of psychoactive substances. This is, if you are not careful, you will die. Uh, you'll overdose. You will die of cancers because tobacco is, is not a, uh, is, is so toxic. Uh, so this is a survival mechanism that people override in order to, to have a good time. Uh, which, all, which begs the question, what is a good time? Is it being stoned? Is it being drunk? Is it forgetting your problems? Evidently, because so many people do it. The most important structure of the reward reinforcement pathway is the nucleus accumbens septi. Uh, this uh, bundle of nerves is the most powerful reinforcer in the pathway. Uh, it is uh, this area of the brain that drives people to action. Research with rats stimulating this area of the brain led to death. Uh, they could no, do nothing else but stimulate this area. It's the pleasure center. This is the famous pleasure center uh, that people talk about. Human <coughs> objects, of course, would do, do the same thing, but of course we don't usually allow them to stimulate themselves to death. They don't eat, they don't, they don't drink, they just stimulate themselves. Social factors tend to affect obsession to use psychoactive substances. The psychoactive <coughs> excuse me. The psychoactive substance uh, alters the brain chemistry to make the individual want to use. Uh, this is one reason why only uh, complete abstinence will stop the craving. Uh, to begin again will lead to the craving starting at the same intense level. And for that reason, if you're an alcoholic, you need to not drink again ever. Uh, some people tell, will, will uh, tell alcoholics, sure, yeah, as soon as you're no longer an alcoholic, you can drink again. But the reality is, if you start, you won't stop. This is what happened to, uh, what's his name, wait a minute, Robin Williams. Robin Williams uh, used cocaine, and he used cocaine a lot. Uh, this is when he was such a funny guy on television, and then when he first started making movies, one of the things he realized was that uh, when he was making his television show, uh, he could ad lib, and that was fine. But when he started making movies and had to remember his lines, all of a sudden, it didn't work anymore. So he decided he was going to go off 
cocaine. And he did. He went off cocaine. And he was clean for an extended length of time. And then, for some reason, he decided to try it again. And he'd been, he hadn't used cocaine in like 15 or 20 years. And here he used cocaine one time fell completely off the wagon, went back to rehab. While he was in rehab, he found out that all of the, the cocaine use he had done uh, when he was younger had really messed his brain up. And he, was, he had uh, fast onset Alzheimer's disease at that point. And it was caused by the cocaine, you know. So he committed suicide. But it, it was because of the drugs. Why are we talking about this? The creativity. Oh, oh yeah. You have to complete abstinence. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> complete abstinence. And it was really kind of strange because people were going, well, he went back to rehab. I don't know why he went back to rehab. The guy's been clean for 15 or 20 years. And of course, the next thing we know, he's dead. He had fallen off the wagon is what happened. <clears throat> Uh, the oddest thing about his, uh, his will was that he had all these really expensive bicycles. As weird, as strange as that is. I'm not sure what it... I didn't know him as a bicycle uh, enthusiast, but uh, he had all these really expensive bicycles. Uh, brain imaging has shown that uh, the brain cells change as addiction develops, while normal memory doesn't take place until an action has been repeated three or more times. Intense stimulation can cause sensitization with just one encounter. And this is what happens with crystal meth. And that's why they tell you not even once. Don't even try it one time. Uh, people talk about experimenting with drugs. Oh, I smoked pot once. I didn't inhale. You know, that kind of thing. Oh, I've only showed up with heroin one time. Uh, crystal meth is one of those things. You use it one time, you're stuck. You're gone. And like... And they say, like, if you try it and then you do get off of it, like, you'll still have, like, those the cravings. The cravings are still there. Really strong, mm -hmm. sadly. And that's the same way with the, the amphetamines, all the stimulants. Cocaine, uh, crystal meth, uh, amphetamines. Uh, see, crystal meth is not that old. <clears throat> it hasn't been around that long. In the 1980s, when I was working in medicine, uh, we had speed freaks. We had people that were using amphetamines. Uh, amphetamines were legal for a really, really long time. Uh, they used them as diet drugs. And then, of course, it, it, it was lower doses. doses. Uh, and then uh, we, we ran into speed freaks, and they would be, they'd have no teeth, or they'd have black teeth. Uh, they'd be skinny as minutes, and they'd, you'd find out that they were like 25 years old, they looked like they were 50. You know, it was, that's what happened with Speed Freak. So I encountered them uh, until before I encountered the, uh, the people that smoked. So you can't smoke amphetamines. It's a, it's a pill. You take the pill, and in 20 minutes you get high. Uh, but with, uh, with crystal meth, you smoke it, so it gets into your system really, really fast. And it's a lot more addictive. Crystal meth is a lot more addictive than amphetamines. These neural pathways are highly sensitive and may cause relapse in just one additional encounter. And that, of course, is the problem. Why do psychoactive drugs disrupt the on-off switch of re the reward, reward reinforcement pathway? One theory is that since uh, they don't originate from an, an essential body need, the brain has no satiation point established for psychoactive substances, so you don't know when to stop. Alcohol is not, nor you don't normally take in a lot of alcohol in your life, uh, so it has no satiation point. You don't know when to stop. I, I dreamed about taking a drink of alcohol last night. <laughs> really kind of strange. I dream about my second wife one day, and then the next day I dream about drinking alcohol. Really kind of weird. I had a drinking contest with her one time. With your last wife? With my second wife. <laughs> I won. You I, won. I won. But I didn't really win. She was an alcoholic, and I didn't know it. Yeah. 
And so we're drinking beers, <clears throat> and she's starting to act really silly. And at that point, she stopped. And of course, I won because we were matching beers. So I thought I won. As it turned out, she was just, she wasn't drunk at all. She was just, she needed an excuse to, to, to act horny, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I won, I won the drinking contest. But then I lost my wife because she, she got, she fell off the wagon. <clears throat> Her nickname was the Jack Daniels Kid. Yeah, somebody that drinks whiskey, corn whiskey. Yeah, it's like she can't drink th three beers. That doesn't make any sense. Three beers, that's three shots of whiskey. Three beers. Uh, anyway, yeah, she was faking it. Uh, second theory is that the on-off switch gets stuck on, in the on position. The person doesn't realize the act has been completed. The person will use until they run out of the drug or pass out. Uh, and you see this a lot with kids. Uh, they'll drink beer and they're thinking, wow, I can drink a lot of beer. This is, I'm not feeling anything at all. And then, you know, after their sixth beer, they're on the, they're passed out on the, on the ground because they've never drunk before. They have no tolerance whatsoever. And they're drinking so fast that it, it, it isn't really hitting your system very, very well or very rapidly. A third theory is that the psychoactive drug creates such euphoria or pain relief that the on-off switch is ignored or overridden by the brain. And of course, um, this is one of the problems that we have when we're dealing with, uh, with people that are drug addicts. The question is, why did they use? If they use because they want to feel good, uh, now we have a, a means of controlling them because it has to do with feeling good. So all we have to do is we have to replace the psychoactive substance with something else that makes them feel good. We need to replace, we need to replace the uh, psychoactive substance. And we can with, I don't know, meditation, poetry, I don't know, whatever it is that, that trips their trigger, but now we can get them off the, the drugs. But what if, it, what if it has to do with pain? What if it has to do with relieving pain? They want to forget. This is harder because how do you make people forget? You can give something to somebody and make them feel good, but how in the world do you make them forget? So if they have a trauma in their life that they're drinking to forget, then it's, it's almost impossible to, uh, it's far more difficult. What we have to do is we have to do uh, uh, psychoanalysis. You know, we, we need to do counseling so that we can relieve them of this pain in order to stop it. Now sometimes the pain comes from childhood, and very often if the pain comes from childhood, then what you're dealing with is uh, uh, an immature way of dealing with their problem. Uh, it was my fault that my parents left, and now I'm a drunk because my parents got divorced when I was five. That's illogical. That doesn't make any sense. It, as an adult, if they're still dealing with it without telling anybody, without any counseling, they're, they're sti they still have that, uh, that uh, uh, yeah, immature way of thinking about things. Yeah. So we can, if we can convince them that, well, you, you're an adult now, you understand that you didn't have anything to do with this, had to do with your mom and dad, and your, your dad wanted to go out and, and find somebody else. You know, it had to do with love. They didn't love each other anymore. Mm -hmm. This is something you understand as an adult, but as a five-year-old, you don't understand it. So sometimes that can go away if that's the problem. But of course, if it's some other trauma. I mean, you can never, if somebody molested you when you're three years old, that's something you can never take away. That isn't a misinterpretation of what happened. Okay. <clears throat> so the, if, it's, if, it's a, if they're trying to take the pain away, then it's a lot more difficult to treat than if it's, they're just looking for a good time. A fourth theory is that the psychoactive substance disrupts communication between the old and the new brain. Uh, many psychoactive substances incapacitate the thinking and reasoning portion of the new brain, and the indiv individual reverts to old uh, brain instincts or automatic functioning. And I don't know how this guy ever got in there. I, I've never tried to crawl into a wheel well before or, or in, into that, uh, 
that tiny little space, but he's been able to do it. <laughs> and he's drunk as a skunk, so you, I don't know. Sometimes when you're drunk, your joints just, I don't know, allow you to do odd things. Uh, the main instrument of the nervous system is the neuron, of course. Uh, the neuron is composed of the soma, the axon, and dendrites. Oh, my back is sore. <laughs> Information comes into the neuron through the dendrites and is distributed to other entities uh, through the terminals, uh, the terminal or the terminals at the end of the axon. This is all, uh, this is, uh, all anatomy. We've already gone through this before, biological site. Each neuron <clears throat> can make uh, contact with one entry up to 100 to 150,000 uh, connections. It is uh, estimated that there is between 100 trillion to 500 trillion uh, neuronal connections in the human body. Neurons are different lengths from fractions of millimeters to the sciatic nerve that can run, uh, can be a meter long and runs from the heel uh, to your spinal column. Uh, and of course, if you've ever had sciatic problems, you can feel every inch of that thing. It hurts. Uh, neurons do, do not touch, but they do communicate with, them, with one another. Uh, this communication takes place in the synaptic cleft, a gap between the two neurons. Uh, in order for the two neurons to communicate, the chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter must pass between them. The neurotransmitter is housed in tiny sacs called vesicles. Okay, <clears throat> the reason I'm, we're talking about this is because now we have to talk about all the neurotransmitters. Uh, most of the psychoactive substances activate or overactivate some of these neurotransmitters, and that's why you have uh, excessive feelings or, or extreme reactions to the, uh, uh, to the neurotransmitters. The first neurotransmitter that was discovered was acetylcholine. Uh, it acts, activates muscles. Uh, it acts as a, a, a vasodilator. It controls mental acuity, memory, and learning. So we need acetylcholine. It is acetylcholine that is messed up uh, when somebody has uh, Alzheimer's disease. You have a reduced amount of dopamine. We can give you a substance that, that uh, increases the amount of dopamine in your brain. It's called L-DOPA. And we can uh, arrest your Alzheimer's disease for a short period of time. But usually Alzheimer's disease means that uh, you have neurons that are being destroyed. And we can't stop the destruction. We can't do that. <clears throat> so what happens uh, is that even if we give you L-DOPA, uh, eventually, of course, the Alzheimer's disease is going to kill enough brain cells that you'll die. That's just the way it works. Um, it comes in lots of different forms. Some people can develop Alzheimer's disease and live for a decade, uh, live for 15 years. I had an aunt that uh, developed Alzheimer's disease and she would, geez, uh, she had a fortune when she uh, developed the Alzheimer's disease, uh, but she had it for such a long time, we put her in a nursing home, and uh, by the time she was done, she was on Medicaid. She had burned through all the money that she had, all the insurance money, all the money. She had a couple million dollars, uh, and she burned through all of that stuff before she died. And she was on Medicaid, and we were paying most of her hospital bills. Well, Medicaid didn't cover. Anyway, and then there's rapid onset Alzheimer's disease. I was reading a posting, one of my students said, one day my grandmother was making uh, fry bread and uh, cleaning the house. The next day, she couldn't do that anymore. And within, uh, within a month, she couldn't move. Within six months, she was dead. That's rapid onset Alzheimer's disease. So it really all depends on what kind you've got. Uh, brain structures and whatnot. <clears throat> Norepinephrine and epinephrine, uh, the second two neurotran were the second two neurotransmitters that were discovered. It, they act as stimulants when the body demands energy. Uh, they control hunger, attention span, uh, motivation, confidence, and alertness. Uh, epinephrine, of course, if you give somebody epinephrine, it, it equals uh, energy. Uh, nor norepinephrine equals confidence and feelings of well-being. Uh, so if, we, if you're depressed, one of the things we can do is we can increase your norepinephrine level and it will make you feel like you're okay. 
It doesn't make you happy. It just makes you feel like you're okay. Dopamine regulates the fine motor muscular activity, emotional stability, satiation, and it is the neurotransmitter in the reward reinforcement pathway. This is one of the drugs, this is one of the neurotransmitters that is increased uh, in most of the uh, psychoactive drugs. Dopamine is the most important neurotransmitter involved in drug abuse, of course. Uh, reduced dopamine leads to Parkinson's disease. Excess dopamine uh, causes schizophrenia. <clears throat> so one of the things that we're doing is that we are uh, increasing your dopamine level uh, when we take psychoactive substances, especially methamphetamines. Your, your uh, dopamine level just skyrockets. This is one of the reasons why, uh, if you've used a lot of crystal meth, then uh, one of the things that will happen is you'll start having psychotic episodes. Now, as far as you're concerned, the psychotic episodes feel good, so you don't really care, but you're fairly non-functional, relatively non-functional, unfortunately. And of course, that's the schizophrenia. I told you about the uh, young lady, she, uh, uh, she was a meth head, and uh, she, she had two boys, and she kept losing the boys, but she let, lost the boys to her dad, and her dad wouldn't let her have anything to do with them until she cleaned herself up. Uh, so she kept using, and uh, every time she went to a certain, she, every time she went to Great Falls, she she used because she she was she had the uh, town wired. She knew where to find crystal meth everywhere. She knew that if you went to this store, you could talk to Sally, and Sally would hook you up with George, who's who runs the bar down the street. You know, it was one of those kind of deals. She she had the place wired. So every time she went to Great Falls, she would use. So, in order for her to stay clean, she had to stay out of Great Falls. Then her father was in, a, uh, was in an accident, and uh, she had to go to Great Falls. He, and they took him to Great Falls. Of course they took him to Great Falls. So they took him to Great Falls, and as soon as she got into town, she, she started using. And she did strange things, like she would kite checks. Uh, she would forge checks. She would steal people's checks, and she would... She would, uh, uh, you know, she would uh, use the checks and, and to get money so that she could buy her her crystal meth. Well, she went to jail a couple of times for forging checks. Uh, so finally, you know, she goes. To, so she's my student, brilliant student. Uh, all of a sudden, she's gone. And what had happened was she had forged a check in Great Falls. And now she was in jail, and she was in jail for a year and a half. Well, a year and a half later, she got out, and she's clean. She's completely clean, despite the fact she's been in Great Falls. So she's okay, and she's okay, and she's okay, until her dad dies. <clears throat> so where's the funeral? Well, Great Falls, of course. Where else are you going to have a funeral? So she goes to Great Falls, and uh, of course she's depressed, so she, and she wants to feel better. So she uses... And this time she had a psychotic episode, and she didn't know who she was. And she thought she was a Hispanic female. And she went to the cops and she said, uh, my father has murdered my mother, and he's buried her body in the backyard. You know, she's this Hispanic lady. And then all of a sudden she would just start blurting out Spanish. Well, some of it was actual Spanish, other it was just babble, you know. So the, the police think that she is who she says she is. And for some reason, they didn't ask her for any identification. So they go to this house, and they dig up the backyard trying to find her mother's dead body. Well, as it turns out, of course, I mean, she's having a psychotic episode. She's not really Hispanic. She's, <clears throat> she's a Grovan and Eskimo. She's Grovan and Aleut, as weird as that is. So she's not Hispanic at all. <clears throat> and finally, while she's sitting there, of course, waiting for them to dig up the backyard, she starts to become lucid again. She starts coming out of her schizophrenic episode and realizing what's going on. And she tries to sneak out the door because she realizes that whatever, 
and she doesn't know what she's told them. And that was the bizarre part. So she doesn't know what she's told them, and she's trying to sneak out the door, and they catch her before she leaves, and of course, they had just brought in an interpreter, because half the time she's speaking Spanish. They just brought in an interpreter to talk to him, to her, and this guy starts babbling in Spanish, and she can't understand a word that he says. And at that point, everything fell apart. As it turned out, of course, her mother was still alive, and her father was dead, and her father had just died. But they couldn't, they couldn't put the two together because they didn't know who she was. She told them she was this other lady. Uh. <coughs> so somehow, they released her, and she comes back to school, and, and I told her, you know, if you do this again, that psychosis might be permanent. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility that, this psycho that your psychosis will be permanent. And so she stayed clean for a while, then she, uh, she started having panic attacks. The reason that she wanted her mother dead and her father to be alive was because her, she was estranged from her mother. So in her brain, she wanted her father to still be alive. Yeah. Okay. But there, was a, there had to be a dead body somewhere. So she said that her father murdered her mother and buried, them, buried her in the backyard. And she just made up this, this address, and they went and they dug, up, they dug up the backyard in that place. She had to pay for the, the, the uh, excavation. And the, <laughs> I know, it was really weird. Anyway, the last I heard, she was okay. But she couldn't drive anymore because she kept having panic attacks while she was driving. She couldn't drive with her kids in the car. She could drive when she, the kids weren't in the car, but she was afraid she would have an accident or do something stupid, which is what her father kept telling her was going to happen. If you don't clean yourself up, you're going to be high some time and have an accident and kill your kids. So now all of a sudden, she couldn't do that anymore. Uh, histamine uh, controls the inflammation of tissue and allergic reactions. Uh, re it regulates emotional behavior and sleep. This is one of the reasons why uh, if uh, you have a cold, uh, one of the reasons that, you're, that you, you, you have so much mucus coming out of your, your sinuses is because the, the tissue is inflamed. So they give you an antihistamine to reduce the swelling of the tissue. So most cold remedies have antihistamines in them. Um, they're starting not to do that anymore because it's causing too much irritation. It actually irritates your sinuses. Uh, if, you don't, if you've got a little bit of a cold and you take an antihistamine, sometimes it will overstimulate your, it'll dry them up too much and then you get an inflammatory process. So, <clears throat> Serotonin controls mood stability, depression, appetite, sleep, and sexual activity. Uh, mood uh, can be elevated by forcing more serotonin in the, into the synaptic clefts. And of course, that's how we, that's what selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors are. They increase your serotonin level. Enkephalins, endorphins, and dynorphins uh, are involved in regulation of pain, relief of stress, uh, immune response, stomach activity, and other physiological functions. It's endorphins that uh, opiates work on. Luckily for me, since I'm not sensitive to opiates, uh, luckily for me, I also have enkephalins and dynorphins in my system, uh, and they control pain. You know, I've, I've been an athlete all my life. I hurt myself all the time because I'm pretty damn stupid. Uh, but I don't have excessive pain. Uh, you know, I sprain my ankle and I can't function anymore because. I have no natural pain control. Well, that doesn't usually happen. Uh, I usually have the same pain control everybody else does. But I don't get runner's high. People keep talking about runner's high like it's this wonderful euphoric of uh, whatever. When I run, I don't get runner's high either. Uh, maybe. I never felt it. <laughs> are you so sensitive to caffeine? Yeah. Okay. So it wakes you up? If you if drink I too drink much of it, it, you can't sleep. Yeah, if I drink, that's why I don't drink coffee. Yeah. Coffee gives me headaches. Coffee gives you headaches. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, but immunobutyric acid, uh, or GABA, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's involved in 25 to 40% of all the synapses in the brain. It controls your impulses, your muscle relaxation, 
uh, arousal, it slows down your brain. Uh, of course, alcohol has a strong effect on GABA as it does <coughs> with, with uh, uh, serotonin. Uh, if you've ever known anybody that was an alcoholic and now isn't, uh, sometimes they'll just have these, these grouchy episodes where you, you can't be around them. Mm -hmm. These are known as dry drunks. And the reason they're having those is because it's an effect, it's an effect of uh, the, the GABA and the ser serotonin. While you're, when you're drinking, of course, it increases your serotonin level, which means that when you're not drinking, your serotonin level goes down. And this is one of the reasons why people um, will become alcoholics. Uh, when they drink, their ser serotonin level is incre increases, makes them feel good. Mm -hmm. So when they're not drinking, of course, with that down regulation situation, now all of a sudden, they're, they're not happy anymore. So how do you get happy if you're a drunk? You go out and drink because that makes you happy. Yeah. It increases your serotonin level. So if, you're a, if you have a dry drunk, <coughs> what's happening, something emotional has happened to you, and your, your uh, neurotransmitters, or your, your neurons, are down-regulating. They're down-regulating because this is a trigger for you. When, before, when you were unhappy like this, you went out and got drunk. Mm -hmm. So they automatically will down-regulate, and that, that's why you get these dry drunks, these, these negative episodes, because you're, you're trying to control yourself. It's a way of controlling yourself. As weird as that sounds. I mean, for someone that's like that, how would you help them maintain that level of being happy? And well, this has to do with, it's, it's internal. Everything's internal. So you'd have to do something external to make them feel better. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Show them a happy movie or something. Something, uh, something positive, right? Something positive. Because what they really want to do is go out and get drunk. Because that makes them happy. That makes them happy. <clears throat> so it's their body having a negative reaction because, because they are in a situation that where before they would have started drinking. Yeah. So their body is, is automatically down-regulating their serotonin uh, receptor sites. Mm -hmm. Because in the old days, they would have gone out and gotten drunk. So it's trying to protect itself. It's the human body trying to balance everything. Our bodies do these things. Glycine is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. It's found in the brain stem and spinal cord. It slows down the brain. Uh, it's prominent in protein synthesis. Glutamic acid or glutamate or glutamine uh, is an import, important excitatory neurotransmitter. It plays a, a major role in cognition, uh, motor function, sensory function. Reinfor it reinforces your memory. It's a precursor for GABA, and that's a real positive thing. Substance P, uh, P stands for peptide, uh, conveys the pain message to the brain from the peripheral nervous system. Enkephalins will block substance P, and of course, that's probably what I have in my system since I don't have or endorphins. Anandamide uh, has an affinity for the receptor sites that accommodate THC. Okay, so we've got this substance, THC, and for the longest time we had no idea why it worked. That's one of the reasons why people said, we have natural THC receptor sites, so, so it must be a natural substance. Well, what happened was, uh, we didn't know what anandamide was. We'd never identified anandamide <clears throat> before. Um, <clears throat> so, and, but people were smoking pot and getting high, and we knew that there was a receptor site that, uh, that uh, worked with, uh, with marijuana. So eventually what happened, we, we actually re realized that anandamide was, was a neurotransmitter. At that point, we realized that THC was actually uh, uh, filling that anandamide receptor site. That's, that's how it worked. Uh, anandamide is found in the limbic system. It, it's integration of sensory experiences with emotion. Uh, and of course, that's one of the reasons why THC, you have the same, that, that type of reaction uh, from THC. Uh, so sometimes you feel the, you know, you're looking at your hand and you can feel your hand, man. I can feel the palm of my hand. I've got to like the whole world, you know. 
So it has to do with emotion. I feel so happy that I've got the world in my palm. Uh, contro it controls learning, motor coordination, and memory. Of course, one of the problems with marijuana is that it uh, uh, disrupts your short-term memory, uh, makes it less functional. Uh, it acts as, an, acts as an analgesic. In other words, it takes pain away. And this is the reason that uh, anandamide does it naturally, of course, but THC, actually it's a CBD uh, oil that uh, takes away the uh, pain. Okay, so now we know. Now we understand why uh, marijuana does the things that it does. <clears throat> because of the anandamide. Uh, corticotropin, uh, what are we talking about? Pituitary peptide, oh, we're talking about the pituitary uh, peptides. Corticotropin uh, leads to ACTH, and which produces cortisone. It aids the immune system, it helps healing. It's part of the stress control, and that's corticotropin. Uh, nitric oxide. This is something brand new. We didn't know this for the longest, long for the longest time. This is uh, something that was just discovered in 1992. Now, to you guys, 1992 was a long, long time ago. But for me, it wasn't a long, long time ago because I was only in my 40s in 1992. So, you know, this wasn't that long ago as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it was discovered in 1992, the functions of the nitric oxide uh, just continues to expand. It is necessary for the erectile function of the penis. This is why we invented, this is how we invented Vi Viagra. We had to, to uh, create a substance that, uh, or a, a pharmaceutical that blocked ni the nitric oxide. That's, that's how Vi Viagra works. Uh, normally, uh, males would wander around with an erect penis all the time if it wasn't for this substance. And of course, because you have this substance in your, in your system, uh, it blocks the, uh, the uh, erectile functioning of the, of the penis. It helps regulate emotions uh, in two large dosages. It can cause cancer and vascular collapse. And for that reason, you know, for a long time they thought, oh, we, you know, we could just use this nit nitric oxide and give everybody a shot of this stuff, and, and it will make them more functional. But the reality is it doesn't work that way. Everything has to be balanced. Uh, alcohol directly affects GABA, uh, metencephalin, and serotonin. Benzodiazepines directly affect GABA and glycine. Uh, marijuana affects anandamide, arachidonyl glycerol, uh, acetylcholine and dynorphin. Uh, heroin uh, directly affects endorphins, enkephalin, and dopamine. So as you can see, the drugs, we, we've developed these drugs because they do something. And of course, the neurotransmitter, if they didn't affect these neurotransmitters, they wouldn't be doing anything at all. Why don't we stop right here and we'll pick this up on...